first training is going to focus on just that training and we're going to investigate a pretty interesting word but it's normally associated with education and education especially in the pest industry is more difficult each year because the workload on the PCOs the pest control operators and the management is difficult to insert and without the training and the education we can't actually educate our consumers and without our consumers being educated then they fall victim to false narrative or whatever they read on the internet one of the words we're going to look at it's actually associated with a discipline an academic discipline called pedagogy now well that's a funny word to say and while it may seem uh, like some kind of nasty insinuation to it because we all think of the word pedophile when we see that but it's not it's actually the teaching of children and what we learn is a the disciplines on how we teach it and trying to get education through to uh, a trade such as a pest control industry and translate that back to the uh, consumer base is difficult as I said with the workload but we're going to take a look at it and why it's absolutely necessary that we investigate new concepts of education in order to get our consumers the knowledge that they need from our PCOs. I'll put it this way, pedagogy example with our business is one of the most powerful pedagogical examples is where customers and PCOs are learning together. The PCO becomes more of a mentor or a coach helping consumers achieve the learning goal. But here's the catch, here's the rub. If we don't have our PCOs educated to the point that they can be the mentor or coach and assisting our consumers then everything we put into play is going to be all for naught because they're going to get as I said false narratives or read what they want on the internet and that's why you have gaps in service that's why some of your fall and winter services and cancellations are so great is because the PCO doesn't really explain it to the consumer base to the point that they understand why they're receiving service when it's 32 degrees outside so let's take a look at it as I said we're going to focus on understanding our fall service and our winter service and unless we as PCOs understand it and call center reps we cannot translate that to our consumer base it's pretty simple when it's 32 degrees outside maybe snow on the ground and it's wretched weather the consumer's misconception is well why are we doing a pest service on a day such as this and ultimately they'll either cancel or move their quarterly service to the spring and it creates a lot of disruption and problems Think about this, call center gets a call, are you an inspector or either a technician? And it's, as I said, it's freezing cold outside, it's inclement weather. And let's say it's an outside quarterly, which most of them are, and they come home, snow's on the ground, or it's, like I said, terrible weather, and they get a bill on the door for $89. And then their natural reaction is, just like any human being would be, why am I paying for this? And of course, if it's not documented correctly or if we can't explain it to them correctly when they call in then that's going to be an immediate cancellation or they're going to move the service and that's a total disruption of service that causes a, a bottleneck in the spring as much as 20 percent of our production and if it's 20 percent of our production it means 20 percent of your income is reduced in the fall and the winter months simply because of misconceptions that we either are, do not articulate well or we don't get across to our consumers so if we want to look at the idea of how we educate we have to educate our PCOs our call center and our personnel first before we can educate our consumer base and explain to them because if you can't explain it they're not going to pay for it let's look at some misconceptions and they're costly misconceptions pest pressure is diminished during the onset of colder months and reduced as the winter months increase now one would think that's true but that's a myth as a matter of fact pest pressure increases as the weather changes insects and rodents all the pests have a biological clock they can judge the weather better than humans can they're better than they're the best weathermen in the world and when you see squirrels running around everywhere gathering nuts getting ready for the winter that's natural behavior for them they know the seasons are beginning to change just like all insects and pests do and they seek natural habitat that is warmer and more conducive to their survival so you have a lot of migration into structures in the fall and especially the winter that you don't have in the spring what you see in the spring is an emergence of things coming out of the house 
that actually enter the house during the fall and spring. So if there's no protection during the fall and winter months, you're going to multiply the effects of the spring uh, uh, pressure. And so the most of your pressure is done during the fall and winter. Yet the conception is, eh, it's too cold outside. I'm not going to take a pest treatment today. So they pass it. And we, as in PCOs, don't explain to them why it's so critical that they don't. Another misconception, or a fact. The pest industry production and income from company to employee decreases during the fall and winter and colder months, despite the fact that I just told you that the pest pressure is actually on the increase. That's a fact. As I told you, as much as 20% of your pay, 20% of the company's pay, is reduced or lost permanently due to misconceptions of fall and winter applications and the importance thereof. So the big question comes up is uh, why? If pest pressure decreases, why does our production decrease for the company and the employee? And as I said again, it's because of costly misconceptions. So how do we reverse this? How do we educate the PCO that now we can educate together with the consumer and reverse some of these trends, not only because of the revenue that's involved with this, it's because of the actual damage it does to the confidence of the consumer when in the spring they feel like we're not doing our job when most of the job could have been most of the problems could have been prevented with winter and fall maintenance if it was explained properly so there's a there's more to it than just revenue and there's another reason because it's an industry employee the pco and some of the companies don't understand the biological cycle of the pests and the animal world we just don't get it. We don't really, as I said, the workload's such that we just pick up a BNG, we go treat. We don't really look at the impact of skipping a treatment or disruption in services on certain animals and insects. And if we as an industry representatives don't understand it, then how can we translate that to consumers so that they understand it and they will actually receive better service and actually the the level of income for employee and company stays steady and consistent and the amount of service and satisfaction stays consistent. And it comes down to education and that's where we started looking at the word pedagogy. As I said, pedagogy is, a, is the methods of treatment. There's several methods of it. One of the methods, and I'm not trying to get too technical with you, but I want you to understand how we can translate this. One of the methods of teaching is social constructionism. Social interaction of a PCO and a consumer working together to solve a problem. So this method of training, once translated to the PCO, then they work with the customer and they both understand the problem of why it's necessary to continue service in the fall and the spring. It's not selling them. This is actually science. This is biology. This is what works. Also, you combine that with a new pedagogy, which is a method of teaching called con uh, connectivism. Connectivism is learning via the internet. Now see all these big words really translate, oh yeah, I get it. You can get on the internet and learn anything. Well, we'll zoom now, look at what the schools are doing. The method of teaching today, because of the, uh, the virus, have went to connectivism because that's where people are actually teaching through the internet, via the internet and stuff. So the words seem really odd and really scientific. They're really not, they're just methods of teaching. But I don't hold you responsible to know the sciences behind the education. But I want you to understand how we can get this education through to you, the PCOs, and through to our consumers. And in the long run, it's going to benefit the consumer and it's going to benefit you and your trade. Okay, so now we know what we need to do and we've defined how we want to put forth this education. Let's examine the price we pay for not doing it. This is what I call the price of ignorance. Now, when I say ignorance, it doesn't mean that you're mentally incompetent, it means not knowing something means you're ignorant of the fact. And the fact that we don't know it and cannot translate it makes us, in certain degrees, in certain areas, ignorant. Cancellation of service. We all know that in the winter and in the fall, when the weather gets bad, they, routes cancel. And when routes cancel, that directly affects you and it directly affects the consumer, even though they don't know it, because of the disruption in service. Customer confidence erosion. Now, how does that play into it? Well, I will explain it to you. If you miss the two services in the fall and the winter, what happens in the spring is an explosion of insects 
and possibly rodents because no effort was put into keeping them out of the house during the migration period. So once that happens, they immediately turned to you and asked you to solve the problem on one treatment. And we all know that it's going to take more than one treatment. This isn't magic. This is science. And when you can't do it because the problem has gotten too bad, for instance, like an odor's house ants where the, the population can explode on you, you can't control it one, they'll blame you. When in reality, it was your fault and the consumer's fault for not maintaining their service through the winter and the spring. I mean the fall, fall and the winter. Inconsistent personal income. When it comes down to it, we're not greedy when we say that we need consistent money. Consistent money, not for the company. Consistent money for you, the employee. You would like to make as much money in the spring, I mean in the winter, as you do in the spring and uh, summer, I, I'm sure. And you can. But you have to massage your base and let them know the reasons that you have to be consistent with their treatments. It's for their good as well. It's basically service malpractice. If you don't explain to your customer why the fall and winter services are so significant, it's like a doctor knowing that there's something could be wrong with you but not telling you how to prevent it. That's, that's medical malpractice. What you're doing is service malpractice. If you're not informing your consumers on that summer treatment, you know your fall and winter treatment's coming up, I want you to understand how critical it is. And as a company, we need to put that education into you, which is what we're doing now. Do not be guilty of service malpractice. It may sound funny and it may sound like a very serious word on such a, you know, on, on a pest control operator, but that's exactly what it is. Let's take a look at how this thing really evolves and how human nature sees it. The conception is that for most people, that most the insect world some of you might even believe that the insect world and the rodents and, and the animal world basically become lethargic. Uh, I think we're smart enough to know that they don't hibernate, but I think a lot of us think that, you know, these problems go away during the uh, fall and winter months, when in reality, the migration inside is greater, as I've told you, but you just don't notice it as much. The outside activity may not be as much, but they're harboring inside the inside. They may go into a semi-lethargic state when it's very cold inside the walls, but it's 70 degrees inside your walls on average. So they're pretty comfortable in there, and they don't really need to move around very much. On some warm days, you'll see ants go outside and feed and you know, and, and gather, gather protein or water, but in most of the cases, they're just in there trying to get cozy and warm, and we all know what rodents do. Rodents will go in and, and, and make a home. And remember what I said? Field mouse becomes house mouse once he enters and he's not leaving. So when that winter starts blowing and you're calling for, they're calling for your quarterly services due, Mr. Smith, um, that's a quarter past not happening because in their minds, everything's gone to sleep. It's winter. Bugs and insects are gone. We're home free. And that's just a, a misconception that's very costly. I like this little guy. If you ever watched a movie, but anyway, what if I told you that pest pressure is greater in the fall than the spring? I have told you that, but do you believe it? The customers will not believe it unless you go into further depth with it. That's a drop in your income and cancel services are on you because you failed to put that out there or more importantly on the company because they failed to educate you. That you can make as much or more money in the fall and winter as you did can in the spring. I can tell you when I was in the field as an inspector, I made more money in the fall than I ever made in the spring. But it's because you know I kind of look at things a little differently, which I'm trying to get you to. And it's not BS. Once you know the science and the biology, and you can convey that to your consumer base or your customers, they're going to believe you because you're telling them the truth, number one. And number two, they're going to buy from you because it's in their best interest. Interruption of the quarterly service during the fall and winter months defeats the migration, the mitigation process. Let me repeat that, it's not migration. Interruption of the quarterly service during fall and winter months defeats the mitigation process, resulting in a chronic, in, in the case of odorous house ants, ant problems. People will tell you that they can't get rid of their odorous house ants. They're notorious, they're horrible. They're one of our worst callbacks. And if you go back and look at the service history on accounts, I will promise you they've missed at least one or both of the winter and fall services. So how can you blame that on the company and the service and the service technicians if you've missed your services? Well, I can tell you how. No one's ever explained it to them. Interruption of the QPC also exposes the customer to more chemical exposure. 
Russ, how can that be? We're not putting any chemical out. I mean, if they're canceling, so how that can be more chemical exposure? Because it's important. Here's what happens. If you allow a house to set for six months, missing the fall and winter services, and the population inside expands, that normal outside service that kept the insects out now has to be performed inside at a heavier dose, subjecting the consumer to a bigger and larger chemical exposure than he would have been on outside service. So you tell me, which gives you the least chemical exposure? And I will tell you, the outside quarterly keeping things out. We want to keep the pest and the pesticide outside unless absolutely necessary. Miss the first, miss the two quarterly treatments during the fall and winter, and you're going to be treating inside in most cases. That the higher warranties in the spring are a result of your lack of effort and treatment during the fall and winter. Do you know that on our inspections, most of the termites that do damage do damage during the winter months? That's why the termite reinspection is more should be more important and more readily done in the fall and winter than in the spring and summer. Because they're eating inside your 70 degree walls. And if you can catch a problem then, then you can prevent damages that would have went six months until the spring till they finally swarm. They have six months to feed on the wood inside before they swarm. Okay, let's take a look at some of the examples of the insects and pests that take advantage of the fall and winter disruption in service that if we can explain to our customers would actually help you not only cash wise but also headaches in the spring and the fall. The biggest one is odorous house ants. Odorous house ants are as you know as a pest control technician are our worst ant to control and there's several reasons for it. One of the reasons is there's they have multiple queens. Most ants only have one queen. These little guys will split off for multiple colonies in the tens of thousands. And what happens is they're not very good. They're pretty good at surviving cold weather, but they're like any other uh, living organism. They'd rather be where it's warm. So what happens is during the spring and the summer, they nest in shallow nest in the mulch right outside the house. When the weather starts to dip, there's a migration. The entire colony, the eggs, no matter how many colonies they are, move inside, inside the walls. And they like to hang around inside the walls, the pipe chases. So that's why you'll get calls during the winter months of ant problems showing up around the kitchen sinks or around the bathroom sinks is because they're following that labyrinth of pipe chases through the house. But as they're in the house, they're constantly working 24 seven producing more eggs and basically multiplying. So what happens with our non-repellent products is we can treat actually the exterior of the house. They still on warmer days go outside and we can have product tracked back into them. Also with our non-repellent product, it's a deterrent to keep them from actually migrating inside once the weather starts dipping. So you significantly reduce the amount of ants on the inside of a house, if not stop them totally, if you, if you maintain your uh, service for in the fall and the winter. But once you drop that fall and winter, remember our pesticides have a a chemical shelf, I mean, a chemical life, uh, very short, 30 to 60 days, uh, you know, we stretch it out to 90, but let's face it, that biodegradation of the chemical happens and you're going to have intrusion from the ants. And these guys are, they're tough ants. Once they get inside the house, as you well know, they're very difficult to get rid of. So if you've had migration into the house for six months, then in the spring, they explode on you. They've always been there, but now they're coming out because they want to enjoy the warmer weather. And you try to solve it one problem and you're going to catch heat because they're going to tell you it's your problem because uh, you ex they expect magic. Their expectation was too high. They're difficult, very difficult to remove from a house once inside. So you really don't want to, if, if there's odorous house and issues at all around the house, it's imperative you keep the winter and the fall service going. Other issues. This is for inspectors as well. If you're working in a DC area, Bethesda, Alexandria, basically anywhere, Squirrels are notorious to enter structure during the fall. They'll, they'll start actually early fall, late summer to start bringing their, net, their nuts inside because they want to nest there. They want to have their, their young there. And the attic is often overlooked. So as a PCO, even if you're doing a quarterly treatment or even as a inspector, 
if you're doing no matter what service around the house, you need to be checking the eaves of that house, seeing if trees touch the structure, seeing if there's any chew marks to prevent this from happening. Once they're inside, again, you're looking at an expensive problem to solve and a problem that could have been eliminated had we caught it first. And that's all part of the migration process during the fall and winter months that is missed if no one's going out there. Bat. I can't tell you how many attics I've went into, just pop the little trap door open and look at the louvers and they're hanging all over the louvers. Uh, that in itself is it's a health issue, it's a problem, and they, do, they are attracted to the warmer climates of an attic. A lot of people don't realize this. Yellow jackets nesting in structure are a health problem. Yellow jackets kill more people every year, especially in our area, than lightning and uh, all these other weird snakes and all this other stuff. Yellow jackets are, are deadly, and they will nest normally in the ground and also in structure. If they're nesting in structure, here's the problem. Do bees, I mean, do yellow jackets die during the winter? Yes and no. The drones die. The queen, however, stays with the nest. She lives on, and there are new cells full of baby yellow jackets. So when a spring and winter pops up, boom, they're right back inside the house and, uh, Another situation that treatment during the fall and winter may could have prevented. European hornets. You, if you're not going into an attic, you can go into an attic and see a European hornet nest two foot long. I mean, th th those are problems that can be eliminated just by inspection. And if you're a PCO and you're in a house doing a regular quarterly treatment, ask if you can look up in that attic. These things need to be caught and taken care of. It's service malpractice if you don't. Rodents attack a structure almost every day during the colder months. And it's just not like, well, it's fall, we're going inside now. No, it's constantly, they're, they're moving in and out. And a lot of times the problem is so great with exclusion that we're actually killing the rodents as they come in, but because the makeup of the house is so uh, holy, it's got holes and seams in it, that the, we're just harvesting them as they come in. Well, the case right there, if you drop off the quarterly treatment and don't switch the bait out, You've compounded the rodent problem to a point you may not be able to get rid of it without a major, major treatment. Termites. This is one of my pet peeves. Term, our reinspections for warranty should be done during the winter. Not because there's nothing to do. It's because that is when termites are active inside. I don't care how active termites are outside. I care about what's active inside that's doing damage to our consumers' homes that we will get blamed for because we missed. Well, Make your inspections and advise your consumers as it's true. We need to look at your house inside during the winter months because that's they're active 24-7, especially on the inside of the house. There's no four else for them to go. This is what causes the problem. Normal service ticket, snow's on the ground. Consumer comes home, sees us hanging on there, and it's $89, and they... Power spray the outside. Well, we all know we don't power spray the outside, hopefully in the snow, but it's the same concept. Let's say the snow wasn't there, but yet it's 20 degrees or even better, six degrees outside. And they get this on there. First of all, the equipment's not going to work. And second of all, why would anyone pay that? But yet that's what they get. So should we just cancel our quarterly service when it's below 20 degrees or 30? No. Not because of the sake of revenue. It's because protection still needs to be afforded to the consumer. But when they get that and that's all they get, what is the conception? This is bullshit. Pardon my French, but that's what it is. And they're not going to pay that and they'll probably cancel your service. So what we developed a couple of years ago, which is not only genius, it's absolutely malpractice if you don't do it. It's what we do is called the winter entry point application. When it's so cold outside that you can't do the power spray, that you can't do the normal pest treatment, you cannot abandon that house to the next quarter. So you have to do other things that create the same effect. And that effect is what we're going to explain to you in just a second. But first, what it does is a mental effect. When a customer comes home at six degrees outside, sees that the house has been treated, and he sees, oh, it's my winter entry point application was performed today not just a quarterly service where someone allegedly went around and sprayed. This is a service that's essential for that time of year and that specific climate that they're in. The winter entry point application is a critical part of your quarterly program. So he sees as part of his quarterly. He now knows or she knows it's, it's, it's necessary. And this is what it says you did. 
This is how it, it justifies in that person's mind, that consumer's mind, that yes, this is worth $89 and I'm glad I did it. And it explains it for you. But if this is not left during your winter applications, then you will be having cancellation of quarterlies. And it's also going to give you a bad service rep. These are important. They're going to be in everyone's box. If your branch is not does not have these, you need to let me know ASAP because it is mandatory that every pest now operation carry these, just like our rainy day service applications. And it's another thing that needs to be done. Now, how do you really service a house when it's six degrees outside and or there's snow on the ground? Well, let's take a good look at it because you're going to say, well, you told me a lot of things that are misconceptions or conceptions, Rusty, but you haven't told me how we should treat it. Well, lo and behold, we're going to learn. Most of you know, but you'd be surprised at how many of you don't do it and causes us problems. First, this is one no one does. When you do your quarterly, check the outside of the house for animal activity. Well, they're not covered under our quarterly contract. No. But it doesn't mean that we can't perform a residential wildlife job for them as a cur not a courtesy, but as a, uh, a, a, a a service that we should recommend. It's like a doctor giving an exam, seeing something wrong with him, going, well, he's in there for a regular exam. He's not in here for this. I'm not going to mention it. Of course you have to mention it. Put it on your service ticket. Miss Jones, notice squirrel activity in the eve of the house. It looks like they may have gained entry. Please call me. Boom. You've done a service. You did the right thing. And you got to sell off of it. This is a pet peeve. I, well, spiders aren't active in the winter. Yes, spiders are active year round. And that's when they're actively hunting. They'll creep back inside the house in a crack and crevice and then come back out, lay their webs and try to catch any insects that are active on the outside. They eat. They got to eat in the winter just like they do the fall. So you still have to do your web busting. That's critical. And that is most pest control companies hound on this. There's one company that knocks on doors and that's the only thing they harp on is, hey, you, do, you got a pest control company? They're not doing web busting. And you know how many quarters they steal a year from us? Lots. You do your crack and crevice around your entry points on the lower level. I don't expect you to pull ladders out, but around the lower levels, you want to do your crack and crevice points around your entry points, such as your windows. Your uh, entry point is for insects, not you. That don't mean you're crawling in windows. Crack and crevice around the windows, entry points, doors, things like this. Check for sweeps on garages. Rodents love to enter garages and other areas of the home. If the, the garage door is not going all the way down, there's a gap there. Advise the consumer to check that out, and they can put a we can put it on, or they can put it on. They need a, a door sweep to put on there to keep the rodents at bay or keep them out. Crack and crevice up onto the siding on the lower level when the, when the siding ends and it becomes brick or, or block or, or concrete needs to be cracked and creviced up under it. Check and reload stations. Stations need to be checked every single time because if the bait is in there, it's be molded, it's frozen, it's cracked, it's no good. It needs to be switched out and a consumer needs to know that you're active, actively doing that because they will go outside and they know how to get any stations down. Remember the internet? Remember what I said about connective theories and connective uh, research? They're on the internet, they can find anything they want, and they'll pop a station and see you ain't been in it in six months, and then you're fired from them and us. Check for cracks around the foundation. Well, the concrete walls. Concrete walls crack. I have one. It's cracked. Check concrete walls. Check block walls. Those are, those are potential entry points, and a consumer should know because it become a potential moisture problem later on. Hose bibs are critical. You should note a hose bib where the caulking has failed, cracked, or fallen off. The consumer would love to know that. That's an entry point. It's going to cause a problem either for insects or rodents to get in, and it justifies your being there. Make sure you note those. Do a good service and make sure you're performing this winter application entry point service to the best of your ability. Now, I'm going to get you on this one. Do we use granular pesticides like we do on a rainy day service? No. When it's cold out, the temperatures are that, especially if it's snowing, it's a no-no. But if the temperature is six degrees or two degrees, first of all, it won't be raining. It'll be snowing, so there is another point. Birds eat granulars. When it's this cold outside, do not use granulars because you will be hitting non-target pest, which is a bird. And uh, if they're feeding on this, they're going to die. Leave it alone. No granulars when the temperature is below 32 degrees. 
No power spray when the temperature's below 32 degrees. You know what will happen? You gotta freeze up on you. Somebody's gonna walk in, and even though we're not supposed to be treating concrete surfaces, somebody will, and they'll slip, it'll freeze, and they'll fall on it. Nope, you do your winter application. You do not power spray when the temperature's below 32 degrees, or going to be below 32 degrees that day or night, and you will not use granulars. Now, that's basically an entire course right there in that one slide. So when someone says, oh, what do we do when it's 30 degrees? You, first of all, you have your winter entry point application card. And second of all, you know how to do it now. So let's make sure that we do it. Let's give the customer good service. Let's make sure that we're teaching these people so that they know what to expect now that you've been taught. So maybe that new word worked out after all. The importance of documentation. It's the last thing I'm going to say about it. I can tell you that every problem we've ever had that we could not solve, it was because the service was not documented correctly. It wasn't that it was done wrong. It just wasn't documented. Make sure you document and let that consumer know everything you did to justify your being there and educate them on why you should do it. I hope you learned something from this.